So he, here are sort of form factors that we think work utilizing existing housing stock that exists in most places um, to create a, a living situation that allows you to live in private spaces, but near friends and family. Uh, so this is not this is not like living in the same like you know room as someone or same apartment. This is this is like we each have our own private space, but we're we're near each other rather than being near total strangers. So we're trying to put people into a different frame of decision making, which is which is let's start with who, let's start with the important people in their life. Who do you want to be around? And then let's pick a place, and then let's search for our individual homes that we can rent or buy because people people have different needs within a friend or family group. Um, within the neighborhood. And, and we try to provide um, statistics that help you understand like, is this neighborhood a good fit for my friend group? Like, does it have the right price stuff? Is there enough availability for the people? Like how many homes come available per month, you know, within a 10 minute walk of this location? So we're, we're focused on like a different set of metrics, um, sort of optimized for creating this mini hood of your friends and family members living near you. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Phil Levin from Live Near Friends, a new organization that is uh, passionate about helping people uh, connect with their friends and being able to live in proximity, maybe even close proximity. Uh, let's get right to it with Phil. Phil Levin, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. John, it's great to be here. Uh, so, Phil, I love giving my guests just an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, what's the 30 minute uh, or excuse me, what's the 30 <laughs> second uh, <laughs> uh, pitch as to who the heck Phil Levin is? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad not 30 minutes. I'm not sure. I'm yeah. much material. No, no, no. We, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep it short this time. <laughs> so, yeah, so really, the question that sort of animates my work is like, how do we create housing that makes people happier, healthier and more connected to the people around them? Um, and so this has taken on various incarnations through my career and my personal life. Um, and, uh, so I, I, uh, helped start a company called cul-de-sac, uh, which I think has been on this, on this podcast before. Um, and we are, we were building car-free walkable neighborhoods in the U S. Um, but I will talk about this a bit. I also do a bunch of experiments sort of in my own life, uh, trying to create the optimal form of housing for myself and my, my wife and my friends. Um, so I do a sort of a few projects there where we try to like innovate and actually like see what it's like to live in our own creations. And recently I started a company uh, called Live Near Friends. Uh, and Live Near Friends is a company that helps people live within a short walk of friends and family, uh, which you sort of think is almost a silver bullet uh, to sort of living a, a happier, healthy and more connected life. Fantastic. Yeah, that is great. And, uh, yeah, it, it, and you're right. I did. I did cover a uh, cul-de-sac. I uh, went to go uh, view a uh, cul-de-sac. I stayed there a couple nights. I uh, had a chance to um, interview Ryan. Uh, we had a great time. We went out on bike and sort of rode around. I pointed a camera at him uh, as we were riding around uh, real quick. For those of you who haven't seen cul-de-sac, uh, it, it's really cool. Cul-de-sac, like you said, you mentioned it just briefly there. It is uh, a, a an attempt to try to try to create a, a bit of a car free or a car light lifestyle. We've got the website right here, kind of uh, popped up. Uh, talk a little bit about the early days there um, in pulling cul de sac together, and, and and I guess really like a short, short, brief version of what inspired you all to to want to do this out in the desert there in Tempe. Yeah, sure. So yeah, cul-de-sac started with uh, three of us, uh, me, me, Jeff, and Ryan, um, sitting in a WeWork office in San Francisco. Um, and we all we had to our name at that point was like a pile of Legos uh, that we would like play with on our desk. And um, we, we sort of had these like two insights uh, that, that we thought were important um, and worth building a company around. So we, one is that um, that walkable urbanism is, in, like, is deeply undersupplied in the US. Um, relative to its demand. Um, so we, we did an analysis which showed that uh, that the majority of Americans, I think the number is 67%, um, wanted to live in a, a walkable neighborhood, uh, but very few of them did. So only I think 7% is a number, maybe 6% um, actually actually lived in a walkable neighborhood. Um, and so we, we thought this Delta was a big market opportunity. And, and we're like, can we actually just build from scratch a walkable car-free community? So that was sort of one insight. I think the second insight was that 
how we were moving and how we were getting around was changing. And that was going to provide new opportunities for how we build built cities. Um, and so like the, the, the sort of like standard of like one person, one car, um, which has sort of been like the dominant way that people have gone around in the past, um, was sort of seeding a bit to these like new on-demand shared forms of transit. So Uber, Lyft, you know, shared bike systems, shared scooters, um, get around, Turo, these, these sort of services. Um, and, and the big one was sort of now coming on the scene, which is self-driving cars. Um, and so we felt there was an opportunity to sort of think about cities differently uh, with the arrival of these new transportation technologies. And that transportation to a very great effect determines like what you can do in a city and really the shape of the city. And if you think about like why London is the way London is and why uh, Atlanta is the way Atlanta is, it really is about the dominant transportation mode at the time they were built. Um, and, and so we want to think of like what a city looks like uh, in, in the future where the dominant transportation is shared and on demand um, and not, not owned, um, like sort of the dominant you know, car you know, paradigm of, of the last hundred years. Right. And what's really, I think, and, and Ryan and I talk a little bit about this in, in, in our interview, and, and I think this is going to be relevant to uh, your, your latest project, Live Near Friends, as well, is that a big part of the opportunity for success um, in, in cul-de-sac or other, you know, schemes that we come up with in terms of trying to uh, create more livable, more sociable places too. And you mentioned it is the, is, is transportation and, and that ability to get from, uh, from where you're at to where you need to be, uh, to get to meaningful destinations and have mobility choice. And really what has been very, very, uh, much our Achilles heel in North America is we've had one mobility choice and that has been the automobile and specifically the personal owned automobile. And that's already putting things, you know, many people, most people at a, a severe disadvantage when you look at the cost of supporting an automobile. And, and Ryan and I talked about this. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's ridiculous, you know, how expensive it is, um, you know, to have the upkeep of an automobile. And if a household has more than one, it, it's even, it's even worse. I mean, right now they're, they're estimating the annual cost is like over $12,000 for a personal automobile. And in certain, in certain states with climate change happening, it's even getting nearly impossible to insure them. I mean, uh, Florida right now is in a, in a, in dire straits. My sister, you know, lives there and she's just like, yeah, it, I mean, insurance rates are, you know, doubling and tripling. Uh, and so it's getting, you know, really, really crazy. And so what I loved about that visit to cul-de-sac was really experiencing the fact that, oh, transit is literally right at the front door. Yeah. Huge, yep. huge, That's right. you know, and, and so you're able to set up you know, and then, you know, the, the opportunity for, you know, using bikes, bikes is a huge part of that, that mix of what's happening there at cul-de-sac, that relationship with electric, the electric assist bike, uh, which what the electric assist bike really does is it, you know, helps open up the opportunity for many, many more people to be able to get around it. You don't have to quote unquote, be a cyclist to be able to jump on, you know, uh, an electric assist bike, or, you know, for that matter, an, an e-scooter, if you want to look at, you know, emerging technologies and things like that, of being able to get to meaningful places. But the key, and, and this is the challenge that even Tempe has, is you can't have a, a dangerous strode right outside your door and expect that people are going to feel comfortable getting on a bike or getting on a scooter or, you know, you know, being able, or even walking for that matter, to get to their meaningful destinations. So that therein lies uh, uh, some of our challenges yeah. uh, with that. Now, what's what's interesting too? So, so you go back in, into into the, the 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 Silicon Valley area, back into the Bay Area, and you start focusing in on on this next project. What was the real inspiration that that got you kind of honed in on? This concept, you, you alluded to it a little bit there in, in terms of wanting to, to have a different living situation and be closer to meaningful people. But what was the real impetus? What was the spark that got you uh, interested in doing Live Near Friends? Yeah. So the, the, the spark was really my own life experience. Um, and so 
my, my wife and I, you know, back back a while ago when we were sort of starting the date and talking about moving in together, um, I was thinking we would do quote the normal thing and like go get like a one bedroom apartment somewhere somewhere sort of near near the center of San Francisco or like a little further away. Um, but uh, she, I should have known she's a behavioral scientist, uh, so she, she she does not take the normal thing as the way to do things. She she wants it informed by research. Uh, and she, uh, she sort of came to me with a raft of research, uh, which basically all had the same punchline, uh, which essentially said something like, uh, that, you know, very much our, our, our behavior is determined by the environment around us and specifically one element of the environment, which is the people around us. So it's like, we, we are a product of, of our surroundings. We are a product of the people who make up our surroundings. And so she said, if we're going to live a great life, um, we're going to do it because we're in very close proximity to people that we love and inspire and support us. Um, and, and that is gonna be the like central design principle of how we live. Um, and so we, since we've done this, we've ended up sort of having a, a couple of like living situations that we've created that sort of like, you know, align to that principle, um, but it, like makes sense for whatever stage of life we're in now. You know, we now have a two-year-old daughter. Um, a, a lot of our friends have sort of started to have kids. And um, we, we live in a place called Radish in Oakland which is sort of designed to be a great place to raise young kids with, with your friends. Uh, so we have, we have uh, just to maybe like describe what it looks like, we have 10 housing units uh, sort of very close to each other. Uh, we call them within baby monitor distance, right. uh, which, which is like, you know, the distance at which you can just take a baby monitor over to your friend's house and leave your kid in your house and still get to them. So it's basically like the, the no coordination, no babysitter distance, um, which is really, really critical. We, so it's like 19 of our friends, uh, 10 housing units, most of which have their private kitchen, private bathroom. And, and we now have five kids under the age of three. The sort of insight from this is like, oh, like our life's really great because we did this. I started seeing just like lots of people. We started writing about this a bit um, in a blog called Super Nuclear, um, which I can share the link for. And uh, I would just have hundreds and maybe even thousands of people just reach out to me being like, how did you do this? I want to do this in my own life. And, and what I realized is that it's, what we pulled off there was actually quite difficult. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of, took a lot of resources. It's like most people probably wouldn't want to put in that sort of effort that we did. Right. But I was sort of asking the question, like, what's like the 90% easier version of what we did that like most people can do in most situations? Um, and, and can we create a company that helps people do that? And so Live Near Friends was sort of born out of the like, the idea that like people really want this lifestyle they don't want all the difficulty we went through to get it. So like, can we make this much easier on people? And I think there's like a, there's like an analogy for this, um, which is, which is Airbnb. So like before Airbnb, if you wanted to stay in a stranger's house, like th think about what you'd have to like go through to make that happen. Um, in a city you went to, right? You'd have to like try to go find someone, reach out to them, like negotiate some sort of thing, like navigate some like, you know, difficult, like social, you know, uh, questions and, and, and then maybe got to stay with them. Airbnb allowed you to basically like, just like pick that off the shelf as a product. Um, and, and I, I think we want to basically do the same for housing. That is a good fit for living your friends and family. Yeah. And we call this proximate housing. And so um, I'm glad you brought up this slide. So the, the, the slide yeah, here is sort of. It, yeah. And, and we'll, we'll describe this here for the listening audience, too. We, we pulled up the slide of the five models for living near friends. And the first is what we call a, a mini hood. The second is the apartment cluster. Uh, the third is the duplex dream. And the fourth is a, an add on ADU. And the fifth is that friend compound. And it's that fifth that sounds most like what you were describing your situation is. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think we have the realization that like we've done the fifth. It's great. Quite hard to pull off. So we're like, what, what are easier ways of doing this that get a lot of the same benefit? And so we come up with basically four other models for how you do that, which we think are, are, are like very achievable for a lot of people in a lot of different types of like urban, urban and suburban environments. So he, here are sort of form factors that we think work utilizing existing housing stock that exists in most places. Um, to create a, a living situation that allows you to live in private spaces, but near friends and family. Uh, so this is not this is not like living in the same like you know room as someone, the same apartment. This is this is like we each have our own private space, but we're we're near each other rather than being near total strangers. 
we, we have a couple models for this. So the first model is something we call the mini hood. Um, and what this is, is it's simply coordinating with your friends and family and sort of like taking a point on the map, drawing a circle around it. So we like to use like a 10 minute walking radius circle um, for, for reasons I'm going to get into in a second. And you just tell all your friends and family, buy or rent your own home within the circle. Right. And that's like a relatively easy thing to do. You know, you don't need to like be a real estate developer to pull that off. Uh, and, and so we, we've, we've created a product within your friends that basically makes it easy to coordinate this with, and with your friends. We have a second model um, called, the, called the apartment cluster, where you sort of like go to an apartment building that has a bunch of vacant units and you say like, hey, can we, went, can we rent three of them from you all once? And that apartment building is going to be very excited about that proposition, right? Especially in a world right now where like apartment vacancies are pretty high. So like, you know, John, I don't know if you've like looked at, uh, you know, like a five or one is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you probably, um, so five or ones are like a, uh, a name for sort of the building that if you don't know the name, you'll recognize it. It's like, it's like every new apartment building that's being built in every city around, around the U S sort of looks the same way. There's like, there's like retail at the bottom and then there's five, five floors of housing above it. It usually has some like bright siding on it. So if you go pretty much to any one of these buildings, they're going to have a bunch of vacant units. You can go and negotiate with the landlord and say, Hey, two of my friends and family members want to rent multiple units. It's great for them. It's great for you. And you have to live near friends and family. So that's sort of a second model. Um, you're showing a picture right now of uh, some folks we know that, that did this. They, they basically actually bought a whole apartment building um, and lived there with, uh, with 16 of their friends and 10 kids. Which is, a, which is a really interesting, you know, kind of twist to what you were just describing, which is, you know, search out a, a commercially owned five over one and, uh, and do that. And, and here's, here's a good example of, you know, what our, our typical uh, model that, you know, this is what they kind of look like here. Uh, they might even have, like this one does have a little bit of uh, retail on the first floor. Uh, and then, you know, and then obviously the residential, but that's pretty, that's pretty wild that the friends went ahead and they're like, oh, let's just buy an entire complex. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's a pretty maximalist version of this. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, totally. I think, I think if you just like, if you have like your cousin who you really like, just moving them into the same apartment building as you is like a ton of benefit already. Uh, so I, I don't know if people get put off by like the idea you need to find like 16 friends who want to do something. Uh, I think, I think. These sort of things like evolve over time. It's like in year one, your cousin moves in. In year two, your friend moves in. In year four, two more people move in. And then like you look back five years later and you actually have something that looks like this, you, but you didn't need to do this all at once. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point too, is, 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 is kind of keep it simple uh, in the sense that it doesn't have to be, it's not an all or nothing. There's, there's like gradations of this in terms of quote unquote, the level of intensity of how you go about it. This would be pretty intense. <laughs> Fantastic. And then uh, number three, of course, is what you, you, you have of, of the, the duplex dream. Yeah. Duplexes we think are underrated. Uh, so if, if you look in a city, most cities right now, um, duplexes trade at a lower cost per square foot than equivalent single family homes. We think it should be the opposite. Uh, a duplex is a place that you can share and build a life with someone you like. It increases the value that you can bring. Someone. And so our goal as a company is to make duplexes more expensive than single family homes. You know, that's not the case today. But if today, if you want to do this, um, a duplex is a great way to do this. And you can find them in basically all cities, uh, more so now that like regulation is changing to a lot for this, this sort of missing middle. So here's a case study of a couple of folks in, in near Fort Collins, Colorado, um, who bought a duplex. Uh, they moved into the top unit. They moved their friends or I think their sister into the bottom unit uh, who rent from them. And then they built a great life, life together. Um, it's a very simple thing. It's achievable for a lot of people. Um, and it, it really does increase the quality of your life quite a bit. Uh, they also managed to actually rent the house next door to some other friends. So they're like building something more incrementally after it. Um, but then they sort of started with this duplex as the, as the centerpiece. Yeah. This is interesting too, because we see in many cities uh, around North America, this push to try to um, gradually thicken up the housing stock, make it legal once again to, to, to build duplexes and triplexes. And, and so this is kind of leveraging that opportunity because that's, that's one of the, the interesting pushbacks that we get, um, of course, is that it might seem a little bit creepy, you know, 
being in a duplex, and that's probably one of the challenges of selling the concept of a duplex, is that by the time they're getting, you know, at that level of wanting to have a maybe a single family home, is you know, I'm done with apartment life, et cetera. I don't, I'm, I'm tired of living next to people that I don't like, <laughs> that are rude, that you know, et cetera. And so this sort of makes it more palatable to be, uh, you know, in a situation where you know, heck yeah, you know, you still have your separate space. You're not like you mentioned earlier. It's not like you're sharing a house. It's not like you're sharing a bathroom. It's like you're close, but you're separate. And it gives you that opportunity to, you know, maybe share (laughs) a a single lot, you know, or, you know, a a duplex, you know, type of situation with a lifelong friend. And I'll I'll tell you, I'll tell you two ways that like this sort of setup has actually benefited my own life, just to sort of illustrate. So uh, I mentioned the baby monitor distance thing. So I've got got a two-year-old and I I think the, the experience of most parents who have a kid that age is they sort of can't leave the house. Because like the kid goes to bed at like seven and you're stuck. Um, you can't go anywhere. You have to like be, be around in case the kid wakes up or does something. And my experience is I text one of my neighbors at 655 and I say, you around tonight? And they say, yes. And I say, uh, watch the baby monitor. And then without any planning, without any coordination, without any babysitters, without any babysitting costs, uh, I, can, I can just leave. I can go out. My wife I can, can go have a date goes to his friends in the city. Um, and so like, th- this is the sort of thing that like a duplex with a friend or family member next door, like just like radically improves the quality of your life. Um, especially at, at a kid having age. The other example is, uh, you know, most of these buildings come with backyards. The, the things you can do with a backyard with two people investing their time and energy and money into it versus, versus one, which is really different. So like, you know, you, you can have that like fancy hot tub. Uh, you can maintain that garden. Like you're, you're actually, you're, you're like life in this like shared space, which actually gets used not that many hours of the year, to be quite honest. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen those like studies about where people spend time in their homes. Right, right. But, you know, so you're, you're not going to have a lot of like conflict of use, um, but you can, you can, you can have something that's actually quite luxurious uh, for sort of 50% off time and effort and money um, versus not. So I think, I think the duplex is a great setup. And, you know, our, our fourth model is adding an ADU, um, which is essentially just creating a duplex by building another building more or less. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I think people have been hesitant to build ADUs for strangers in the backyard because they're like, I don't know if I want some random stranger in my backyard walking through my yard every day. Um, but I, I think it's a very natural thing to do for a friend or family member. I, I will give a bit of a shout out to um, uh, Dan Prelick, who's actually a uh, cul-de-sac's main architect. He's coined the term missing middle housing, uh, which is something he's sort of worked on for like a decade or more, um, which is like, you know, getting cities to allow you to build this like gentle density of, of, two, three, four units on a lot. Um, so no, not skyscrapers, not single family homes, but the in-between things. And I think these these sort of like forms of housing, which are more and more legal in every, cities every day, are gonna enable these sort of living situations that would have been harder earlier. Right. Yeah, and that's, as, as I alluded to earlier, um, is that we're seeing this uh, push by cities uh, across the country really around the world to try to allow uh, the opportunity to to thicken up the housing stock and create some gentle uh, gentle density and that's one of the things that you know they're trying to uh, you know allow is make it easier to build these you know granny flats and accessory dwelling units and and being able to make that legal again I know in California they've had a push uh, for being able to convert uh, garages, uh, be able to make it. And, and really the the part of the, the key thing here too, is it's much of these, these opportunities to add additional housing has been just mired in, you know, legal challenges and funding challenges. And so making it easier from a city perspective and maybe even a state perspective from a legislative and a policy perspective uh, so that people can affordably be able to add an accessory dwelling unit, uh, I think is is really, really important because right now when you, when we've like you looked at the opportunity here in, in, in Austin to do it in our backyard, it, it's it's like 
the the cost of pulling those permits and doing all that work it just doesn't ever pencil out but if we but cities can actually help themselves with this by changing some of their land use codes making it easier uh, to be able to do it streamlining the process and if if memory serves me correctly, California has done a lot of things to try to make that a lot easier, which makes this a possibility a much more viable possibility, a much more affordable possibility. Yeah. And actually, you're on the perfect slide for that point. Um, so we, we built one of these in California. Um, so what, what you're seeing in the, in the slide uh, is, a, is an accessory dwelling unit we built in our yard in Oakland for our friends to live with us. Uh, so this is Carmen and Osman and their, and their baby. Um, and uh, they got to basically design their own home. And, and so, uh, and I think when people think about these, they often think about like the garage conversion, um, which is certainly a, a nice form factor and is very inexpensive. Um, but you can actually build like reasonably sizable homes for people under these laws. So th this is a uh, two bedroom, two bath standalone house. Uh, this is like as nice as whatever single family home they were going to go build for themselves or buy for themselves. And like, you know, tremendous props to California um, for making this happen. We we got this permit for this in 40 days after applying, uh, which I think years, you know, before this happened, that would have been like a three year, you know, suffer fest to get there. Um, and, and so we, we were able to like, you know, get permitted relatively easy to build this. There's still a lot of kinks to work out in the system. I don't want to give too rosy of a picture. It was, uh, yeah. we, we did. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this going, 40 days? <laughs> I don't know if you have read the new book uh, by Chuck Marone, uh, Housing Trap, um, but he, he addresses that in the book. And one of the things that he talks about is, you know, cities, you know, can help this along. They can help, you know, make more housing become more affordable by streamlining the processes, which is just what you said. And the way he frames it in the book is, you know, you should be able to walk in in the morning with, you know, your plans and with your paperwork filled out and then walk out with the permit, you know, after after that afternoon or whatever. I mean, it's essentially instantaneous as long as you are not like completely, uh, you know, doing something that is out of the ordinary. It should not be, you know, something that is so onerous. I guess 40 days is great if, you know, before it was 400 days, but still it's a long way from being streamlined. I think uh, I, I want to live in a world where you upload your plans and instantly the, the computer just evaluates it and says, does it meet the rules or not? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It proves you on the spot. Exactly. Um, exactly. I, I, think we're, I think we're pretty far from that, but, uh, yeah. but it, it's, it's, uh, I don't think there's anything really standing in the way of that, aside from the desire to do it. Yeah. Now we're back at, at, at the, the forum factor number five, the friend compound. And this really reminds me of um, the pocket neighborhood uh, type of, of, of context. It also harkens back to uh, the uh, apartment courts that, that were uh, really popularized in Southern California in uh, down in the Los Angeles and Pasadena area uh, around the 1930s, 1940s and into the 50s. Um, I just had the opportunity to chat with Ross Chapin a couple days ago um, at the Congress for New Urbanism in Cincinnati. And I've had the opportunity to film and profile some of his pocket neighborhoods. This really reminds me a lot of, of that. And we talk about in my video with him about the levels of sociability that is reinforced. And I get I get the, the idea that this is exactly what you're talking about is, you know, having that that type of opportunity to um, make your living situation much richer and much more fulfilling. And again, still being able to have separateness, but actually, but also being together within a, a neighborhood and within a community. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, uh, I think you're right to analogize this to a, to a cottage courtyard or a pocket neighborhood. I think, I think they're, I think they're speaking to the same thing. Uh, we call it a friend compound just because, you know, in, in our version, it's, it's occupied by your friends, but I think, I think right, the architectural right. form factor is, is, is basically the same. Yeah. So the radish is my home. Um, it's where I live with my wife, and my kid and, uh, 19 of our friends and their kids. Um, and we, we, we sort of built it for them and together with them. It's actually, it's actually co-owned by, by 23 people and, uh, and an LLC, there's a whole financial structure to it. 
it's a complicated thing. Uh, and like, we, we like, we, we enjoy doing this cause we're, we're geeks and we, we, we enjoy things like this. I, I think it's a, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of people that like want to do this and have the energy to, um, the other, the other models we talked about earlier, I think are more approachable by most people in most places, whereas this is more of a, I mean, this is more of a, like, uh, a enthusiast, um, <laughs> sort of, sort of project to take on. Uh, but when you can pull it off, it, it's really fantastic. And in our life, our life there has been really, has been really great um, because of it. Yeah. And in going back to even to cul-de-sac, um, what really I think helped make that possible. And Ryan and I talked about this in the interview is that they were able to work with the city to have a relaxation of parking minimums. And this is the same thing that, that comes up when I think about this. It's the same thing that I think of uh, when it comes to the most recent, you know, policy change that happened here in Austin just last week when the city council made it legal for every single family, you know, or the minimum lot size for a single family dwelling is now something like 1,800 feet. And so huge. I mean, essentially, that means almost every single current single family lot could be you know, three <laughs> households instead of just one. And the number one thing that people start freaking out about within the neighborhoods, the NIMBYs is, oh my gosh, the cars and, the, and da, 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 da. And, and it's imperative that there is that thoughtfulness of trying to decouple parking minimums from doing these types of things uh, because it, it doesn't pencil out. You know, and cul-de-sac would not have penciled out to the same level of richness, you know, and that was one of the, you know, the quotes that, you know, that Ryan had is we, we have all this, all this sociable space because we didn't have to provide parking. I look at this, I look at Radish and say, yeah, this wouldn't pencil out if you had to have X number of parking units per every, every dwelling in most cases. And, and if you did... What a waste! Because then that would be a whole lot of wasted space. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, we were talking earlier, John, about like the the, the sort of societal costs of of you know you know uh, everyone owning their own car. Yeah. I, I, one that actually Ryan Coldesack talks about a lot is uh, is that you know for every for every car there's actually four parking spaces right. allocated to it, and, and a lot a lot of the reason for that is we have these parking minimums, which essentially mandate that that parking spaces are built whether or not there's anyone there to use them. And, and, and the way this sort of appears as a cost in your life is this increases the cost of, of, of housing and it increases the cost of retail. And it ends up in the cost of your goods too, because uh, that shopping center has to build parking more than they need because you know, they're, they're, they're mandated to and they can't respond to the actual demand for parking. Yeah, but I, I think at the end of the day, like we as a society need to like grapple with, with trade-offs in, in, in places with scarce land, which we have scarce land in most cities, we need to basically ask ourselves, like, you know, are we are we in deeper need of more parking or are we deeper need of more housing? Uh, and I think the like pendulum has like swung so far to us being in deep need of more housing, as signified by the just extravagant like rise in housing prices for the last couple of decades. Uh, and I think we need to like reevaluate this sort of like mandated use of land for parking, especially in urban areas. Even just like letting housing be built is step one, you know, and and like, you know, but the the opposite of mandated parking would be mandated housing, which we, we're not even going to talk about. But even just allowing housing, I think, is like is, is maybe a pretty reasonable first step. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's pop back on over to the website and talk a little bit about how people can interface with uh, Live Near Friends. Uh, I'll let you just kind of, you know, riff on it as I kind of scroll down. So when somebody lands here at uh, Live Near Friends. I know that you do have a blog and people can sign up uh, and, and get, uh, you know, posts when you guys do your posts as well. Uh, but go ahead and walk us through uh, what happens when they interact with the site. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so, so right now we've built Live Near Friends to um, sort of allow you to organize around one of those models we talked about earlier, uh, which is the mini hood model. Um, you know, the, the company's only six months old, so we're, we're still developing some of the some of the other product lines right now. Um, so we, we plan to have more stuff around apartment clusters and duplexes soon. Uh, but right now we're focused on this on this mini hood. And so what the tool is, is, is a coordination and search tool 
that is a multiplayer tool rather than a single player tool. Uh, so, so right now, if you search for housing on any of the sites, you might go to search for housing. Um, it's, it's trying to optimize for your individual needs just for yourself with no, with no reference to any of the people that you might be wanting to live around. And, and so we, we turn this into a coordination game um, where, you know, one person's going to sort of put a stake in the ground and say like, Hey guys, let's all try to move near into this neighborhood. And, and then you can invite your friends uh, and you and your friends can, can search for housing together in that neighborhood. You can favorite homes, comment on homes, share the homes. It's sort of like a, it's a social network on top of, on top of a listing site. Um, it's sort of like a group chat on top of a listing site is maybe a better way. Of yeah. I, I'm, I'm, that's exactly what I'm looking at right now is it, it looks like you see all the little icons there of the, the initials, uh, BFFs. <laughs> and so, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm with you. And so, you know, if you think about like, you know, if you go to a typical listing site, like, you know, I, I think, and my, my, my wife, who's a behavioral scientist talks about this a lot. Like, I think like our, our, our like choice architecture is really important. Right. And so like the choice architecture of Redfin, Zillow, whatever, realtor.com is like, how big is the yard? What is the bathroom tile like? How many square feet? Um, and it turns out none of that stuff actually makes us happy. Like none of the research shows it does. But it, this is the frame of decision making they put you in. Uh, and so we're trying to put people into a different frame of decision making, which is, which is, let's start with who. Let's start with the important people in their life. Who do you want to be around? And then let's pick a place. And then let's search for our individual homes that we can rent or buy because people, people have different needs within a friend or family group um, within a neighborhood. And, and we try to provide um, statistics that help you understand, like, is this neighborhood a good fit for my friend group? Like, does it have the right price stuff? Is there enough availability for the people? Like how many homes come available per month, you know, within a 10 minute walk of this location. So we're, we're focused on like a different set of metrics, um, sort of optimized for creating this mini hood of your friends and family members living near you. I love it. I love it. It's so fascinating too. You've mentioned your wife a, a couple of different times and the, um, you know, the behavioral side of things. That's very much a, a part of my background as a behavioral scientist. And my area of, of emphasis uh, was healthcare behavior and, and really looking at health promotion and how we can create environments which encourage healthy, active lifestyles. Hence, Active Towns is the name of the, uh, the channel here. And so I really look at um, our, our communities, designing our communities that give us the opportunity to live that healthy, active lifestyle. Um, but it's also I important, too, that we, we have that sense of sociability that comes with it. And I had Ann Sussman on um, a, a Gosh, a couple of years ago, uh, she was the author, along with Justin Hollander, of the book Cognitive Architecture and looking at how architecture and how we, you know, from a behavioral standpoint, we as humans um, relate to our surroundings and our, our, our environments. And we, we they hone in a lot on, you know, the architecture of buildings and how uh, how how the human body relates to that. And, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier with the clusters and the and the and the um, the pocket neighborhoods, one of the things that Ross does a really good job on with the with the architecture and the design is creating design that is sociable just by the way it is created with the front porches and with the the the, the different layers of 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 interaction and privacy that goes with that. And so as, as you're mentioning this, I'm like, oh, yeah, I mean, there's so many different layers that we need to think about for this to you know, really fire on all cylinders. And I could totally see how your little, you know, friends hood that you have put together uh, is is just, you know, got to be just so delightful on so many different levels. What from your experience do people need to, like, think about so that the whole thing doesn't blow up in their faces? You mean after everyone's moved in? Well, yeah, and you know the concept of even getting to that point because I'm 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 imagining there there could be some drama even getting there. So I'm oh, sure yeah. you guys have some experience now uh, of uh, because you're living through this of how to navigate through because you know even amongst friends sometimes you can have some challenges. This is true. 
Um, so th th there's sort of a common success factor we see in every example of this that we see working. That is, there's usually a personality that we like to call the instigator, um, who's like who's like the person who pulls it together. And and every friend group and family knows who this person is. It's like it's like the person who organizes the ski trip, or like the person who organizes like the bachelor party or like whatever the thing is. It's like it's like the organizer in the friend group. Typically, what we see is like that person is is like planting the flag and saying like, hey guys, let's do this. And maybe they're a little persistent. Maybe they're a little annoying, like, you know, but like they're, they're the ones that actually make things like this happen. And, and so what we usually don't see is like seven people all come together at the same time and try to like code negotiate something that actually doesn't work very well. Um, it's hard to come to consensus on anything. Usually we see like one person who's like, guys, let's make it happen here. Who's in? Um, and, and people either follow them or don't follow them. And, and so I, I would, uh, if you think you are this personality, and I suspect John, many of your listeners are probably this personality. Um, I, I, I would encourage you to think about yourself as an instigator for creating like, you know, the best setup of like life you can have for the people you care about. And like think of this as like a gift that you can give to the people that people that you love. I love it. That's really, really wise too, because you, you, the, the example you gave was like the ski trip, <laughs> yeah, the friend's ski trip. And it's like, yeah, there always is that one person, that instigator that's like, oh yeah, we're totally going to do this. And, and, and by the way, I've already done the research. I've got the, this, you know, figured out, we're going to, you know, go to Vail this year and, and da, 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 da. And it's like, then everybody, you know, falls in line and follows and, and gets going. Uh, to close us out, talk a little bit about what you imagine the organization doing and being to help facilitate more of this being a feasible option. Uh, I had this discussion with with Ryan about, you know, cul-de-sac and how they really were very, you all were very intentional about working with the city to ensure that the project could be set up for success. You had the transit stop there. You're working on trying to make some um some safer uh, bike facilities, uh, a reality there to connect to the Tempe marketplace. What do you imagine your organization, this organization doing to help, you know, grease the skids a little bit and maybe encourage uh, some policy change? We mentioned, you know, land use uh, stuff. We mentioned parking minimums. Talk a little bit uh, to, to that and that'll be a, a good way to bring this all to a close. Yeah. So I, I think that I think the main response we need to see is actually is actually from the people that actually build housing. Uh, and so r right now, the incentives are such that if you have a piece of land and you're like, I'm going to go build something, you know, you're probably building like a single family tract home, something like that. And, you know, the our, our built environment is not determined by like a few people in a room. It's determined by like, you know, it's an incredibly fragmented industry with like hundreds of players in every market. Um, no one has more than even like a 1% market share, I think. I may be wrong about that, but like it's, it's extremely fragmented as, as these things go. And so to, to get a change, what you need to see is you need to change the incentive structure for all these small players. And, and I, I think there's an analogy for a company that has done this recently, which is Airbnb. Uh, and so, you know, Air, Airbnb um, started by sort of like, you know, saying like, hey, let's have people like rent out their extra bedroom and their extra department when they're not there. It's actually not what Airbnb is today. Airbnb today, Airbnb today is like mostly like professional uh, owners, professional developers, building purpose-built Airbnb units and professional managers renting them out to people on Airbnb. Hmm. So they've gone through this like evolution and uh, they've been so successful at this that like, you know, the whole industry is now building real estate differently to like, to like serve the Airbnb audience. Um, so much so that like regulation is coming on to like basically prevent them from doing that. That's how, that's how successful we've been. And, and so what I want to provoke is a like supply side response to by proving that there's a huge demand for people that want to live near friends and family and having developers build for that demand in the same way that Airbnb proved there was a latent demand for short term rentals uh, that then allowed a developer to like build for that for that demand. Um, and so. I want to get like as many people searching to live near friends on our platform as possible. And then if you're a developer in X city, you can look and say, oh man, there's like, there's like a thousand people that want to live 
a like three person setup on a piece of land, I'm going to build that for them. And we want to be the platform where that transaction can easily take place uh, to, to make that easier for both the buyer and the seller. So th- that's sort of the eventual goal is to provoke like a different response from all the entities that actually make the city what they are, who are all these like small players who just every day go out and build things. Um, and today they're building a lot of single family homes. And tomorrow we want them building the cottage courtyards uh, of this world instead. And what's interesting too is that one of the part, one of the biggest challenges about what we're getting today is that the the financial you mentioned the incentives the financial incentives of uh, what we're getting as a product uh, and it's primarily two main products really that we're we're getting in in abundance and that's the single family homes and as you mentioned it earlier the five over ones. Those are the two financial, uh, essentially they, they have become financial products in and of themselves because you can get easy money to do it. You can, you know, not only can you get easy money to build it, you can also get easy money to buy it. And then that, you know, ultimately is a financial product in and of itself because then your mortgage is, is, is sold off and, and, and et cetera. So it's, it's really the, the game is is right now structured in such a way that that is very much uh, fundable. It sounds like one of the biggest challenges that we have is creating um, a better game, you know, a better system so that if you want to have a, a, a five unit cluster, how, how many uh, how many acres is, is your place where, where you guys are with your cluster? Uh, so it's about half an acre. Okay, so it's a half an acre, so it's it's certainly much larger than your typical single family lot. What's the origins of that? Did you guys cobble that together, or was it already a cluster? Yeah, we uh, we bought we bought a lot with two two buildings on it. We built two more buildings, and we um, were able to acquire two neighboring properties um, coincidentally. Yeah, so you 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 cobbled it together in terms of you know uh, piecing that together, and I think that that's very very doable, um, and I guess that would be one of my 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 hopes is that as this catches on, and I think it will catch on because I think there's a lot of very very attractive incentives to being able to create a more sociable living environment in within that. Hopefully, we can help guide many of these communities to make it legal to do this, <laughs> make it easier to do this. And that's what we were talking about earlier is, is let's, let's streamline the process so that it's not taking somebody 40 days just to get a simple permit for an ADU. Totally. And John, I, I think you're absolutely right about like why the things that we're seeing getting built are getting built. Um, it's like, you know, if, if in column A you have the thing that has like, you know, zoning certainty and financing certainty, and the column B of the thing with zoning uncertainty and financing uncertainty, like which one are you going to build? Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think this is a general challenge is like, how do we build an experiment with new kinds of housing products? Um, when like the, the like risk premium to doing it's quite high. Right. You, you get, you get, you get punished for new ideas by the market. You get punished by the planning authorities and you get punished by the, the, the people that, that finance these things essentially. Um, for, for doing that. And, and I think, I think we need like a, I think we need a system where we can have a framework of experimentation right. um, that we don't right now in the real estate industry. And so in, in the tech industry, we've got this, you know, so like, you know, there's a, there's a whole system where you can like start a startup and it's quite easy to start a startup. Like, you know, they will roll out the red carpet for you to start a company. There's all these services that help you do it. Uh, all these accelerators and whatever. We don't really have the equivalent in the real estate industry. And so everything will push against you rather than try to help you do it. Um, and I, I think we'd see a lot more innovation in the space if, uh, if, if cities would see value in, in basically experimentation on a small scale. And like they, they, they know like one development is gonna destroy your city. I, I think we should be more willing to see like one thing happen and, and just, just to see just to see how it goes and like learn from that. Um, and, and experimentation is how we, is how we make progress. Um, and I think the same goes on the financing side of things. Like, you know, it's like we we can't know we can't know the underwriting data on something if we haven't tried to underwrite it before. 
Uh, so like we, I, th I think we just need data points out there on things. Yeah, yeah. I, and that would be my call to action is, you know, for anybody tuning in, watching this or listening to this, if you are at all uh, within city government and, and have the ability to, to start influencing some of these policies that are, are in place uh, for, for land use. And uh, yeah, we need more housing. We desperately need more housing. We may need to make it easier uh, to build that housing from a financing standpoint, from a, a permitting standpoint, and the opportunity to uh, densify and thicken up our housing stock within meaningful walking and biking distances to other meaningful destinations, including your friend's place, uh, is good for active towns. And I am absolutely delighted to have had this opportunity to you know, promote this and uh, chat with you here today, Phil. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. John, thank you. Thanks for the work you do. This has been really fun. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Phil Levin from Live Near Friends. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content I'm creating here on the Active Towns podcast, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to the website activetowns.com org and click on the support button uh, again thank you so much for tuning in it really means so much to me and until next time this is john signing off by wishing you much activity health and happiness cheers and again sending a huge thank you out to all my active towns ambassadors supporting the channel on patreon buy me a coffee youtube super thanks as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.